What is the routine to improve on the English section from 550 to 650? What is the schedule? I usually get a 30 on a reading section in college word and a 32 on writing. But on the SAT test day, I got 24 and 30. Try my best to POE. I know I should practice a little every day on reading or writing. Is that a study schedule I can adhere to? Okay, so a few questions here. I'm going to try to simplify things and keep things as simple as possible. Um, the first thing I would say about improving on the English section, obviously you've got reading and writing. There's two different situations for both. When you're talking about writing, the two things you have to work on are your grammar rules. So for writing, we have grammar rules and then rhetorical skills questions. Those are the questions where you have to add or remove a sentence, change a paragraph around. And my writing course, which is available free, it's on YouTube, it's on my website, reasonprep.com, covers that completely. If you haven't already, work through that course. If you have worked through the course, course already, I recommend uh, working through it again because that's really all you need. That, do some practice tests. The errors are really repetitive. The rules are very consistent. Learn those and you're good. Reading's a lot trickier because there's not really any rules, formulas, concepts you can learn. It's more about the skill of reading, which is something that is a skill that you build over time. It's not something that you can get one trick or one tip and it's fixed. So that's going to take a bit more consistent effort. You're going to have to work through practice tests. I have videos about this topic uh, in terms of how to practice reading. Uh, there's a video I have in, on my YouTube channel about how to, if you run out of practice tests, what to do, because you really want to use real SATs to practice the reading. You want to avoid any third-party material. In terms of a study schedule, you've already hit on some of the major points. You want to just be consistent. Be consistent. So that means if you can study, it's much better to study 20 minutes per day, six days a week, than do nothing for five days and then cram couple hours on two days or uh, do four hours of studying on one day. It is much superior to do a little bit every day. So you should be studying, let's say, I don't know exactly when your next test is, but just as a baseline, you know, 30 minutes per day, five to six days per week. If you can push it to an hour per day, that would be good. But anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour per day, when you're just doing your practice sections or you're watching my videos or you're doing workbooks, whatever you're doing, um, 30 to 30 minutes to an hour per day, five to six days per week consistently, that's good. Uh, and then occasionally, I'd say once every two weeks, a full practice test. But I highly recommend don't just do full practice test, full practice test, full practice test, full practice test. You got to do a lot more of little work in between. So whether that's watching my videos, doing practice sections times, doing stuff out of books, uh, you want to do a lot of that. So you really only should do a full practice test once every two weeks, once every three weeks, something like that. Okay, so we've got a question about ACT prep. So what's the best book and resources for studying ACT? Okay, so I'm gonna give you the <laughs> businessman's answer and then I'll give you some other suggestions as well because obviously I'm gonna recommend my courses. I mean, why would I not? Uh, so I have full courses on the SAT, uh, the ACT. I've got a free English course that many of you watching this probably are already using, but then I have courses for math, reading, and science, and essay, in addition to essay grading, in addition to solution videos to all eight red book tests, um, in addition to another five test solutions to five other tests released by the College Board. So my ACT courses are, of course, what I recommend. I go through everything. They're comprehensive. I design them to be the only resource you would need to prep for the ACT. So that is the biased answer. What are some other things? What about books? So I don't sell any books. What about books? So the thing with, as I've discussed elsewhere, third-party books is you want to use them carefully. You should never use third-party books for full tests. Uh, those scores are meaningless. Pay no attention to them. Uh, you should use uh, their websites out there, Crack ACT being the big one, where you can get previous ACT tests. Um, of dubious origin, but you can still get them and use them. Uh, those are the best to use if you're going to do full tests. The point of third-party books is to isolate topics. So I would say, with rare exceptions, third-party books for ACT, you know, Barron's, Princeton Review, that kind of thing, not really useful at all for reading and science. A little bit more useful for English and math because you can target particular topics. In terms of particular books I recommend, um, you know, none. You know, the, the big guys are probably fine. I typically like Princeton Review. 
uh, as the big one. Uh, Barron sometimes is pretty good if you want some harder questions. They tend to be harder than average. Um, there are some kind of third-party books that I'm loath to really recommend any for a variety of reasons. I would say don't worry too much about the best book. Most books out there are going to be fine for what they're worth, which is to do supplemental problems and supplemental learning. The core of your studying should be real ACTs, real tests, real sections, real questions. That should be the core of any ACT or SAT studying. Uh, and then, you know, how else you supplement that with books or my courses or whatever, you know, that's up to you. But it's not as big of a deal as it may seem. Okay. What is the best online resource for studying ACT for free? So I have one free course, which is ACT English. That's available for free. It's a complete course. You can use that. That should teach you everything you need for ACT English. Uh, my other courses are not free, though, so those are paid. Uh, in terms of other ACT online resources, I mean, there's probably a bunch of random stuff out there. There's no Khan Academy, unfortunately, for the ACT yet. Um, maybe one day, but uh, not yet. So, uh, I mean, Crack ACT's got practice tests. I mean, that's probably the best free resource, crackact.com, I think it is. Let's see. Yeah, crackact.com. Um, that's probably the best resource for practice tests. Um, otherwise, you know, there's probably videos on YouTube. I would check to see what, here's the thing. Um, unless you have Google and Bill Gates giving you money to make courses and stuff like Khan Academy is doing, um, or if you're like independently wealthy and want to give away a bunch of free stuff, it's really hard to find quality free ACT prep material because most of the time people are going to charge for that on some level. Um, so, but with using the free stuff you can find, like my free course, other free material on YouTube or elsewhere, uh, borrowing books from the library, if you have access to that could be a way to do it. Um, plus using the tests on Crack ACT, you should be able to put together a good prep program. Like, even though I like my courses and I think my courses are awesome, they're not essential. Like, I don't market anything that I offer as like, if you don't have this, you're going to bomb the test. Because that's just not true. You can put together a good study program with freely available stuff. You just have to be, in the case of the ACT, a bit more creative, and to some extent with the SAT, a bit more creative in finding those sources. How can I identify my weaknesses in the reading section? How can I prove them once identified? So there's a lot of aspects to this. Um, the problem with reading, as you probably know, compared to math or writing or English, uh, is there's not formulas or, or concepts that you can really learn in an atomized way. Whereas for math, you can learn formulas. For English, there are grammar rules. For reading and for science on the ACT, none of that thing exists. So that whole bit is out. There's no content that we can focus on. However, there are skills. There are things that are based on reading skills, and then there are aspects based on the particular test. So for reading skills, I'd say there are a few things that you can potentially identify. So one would be vocabulary. One would be understanding sentence structure, which is kind of related to grammar. A lot of times, if you don't understand how sentences are put together, that can affect the way you comprehend the passage. Identifying main ideas, um, finding evidence in the passage, which is huge. So being able to pinpoint here are the lines that give me the answer to this question is, is really important. And I would say that for reading skills, that's probably the majority of it. When it comes to tests, so you didn't specify which test, whether it's reading or, or, or SAT, so I'm gonna be a bit general. But then there's like test skills. So there's, te there's aspects of the ACT or SAT reading that are specific to those tests. So this would be things like question types. Are there particular question types that you're consistently getting wrong? Like vocab and context, inference, main idea, line reference, keyword, whatever, function. Uh, if you're getting those wrong consistently, that would be something to focus on in your in your review. Um, trap answers. If you are consistently falling into the same kinds of traps, recycled words, too extreme, half right, all wrong, uh, opposite, whatever it might be, the different traps that I talk about in my courses, um, that would be something you want to pay attention to. Time management. So if you find yourself running out of time or using your time poorly, that would be something you can determine in your testing, when you do practice tests, practice sections, that would tell you what you 
would need to work on. So what you would do to identify your weaknesses is do time sections and then analyze the test. I've talked about this a lot. It's so important not just to grade the section or the test that you do and move on. You got to spend time that document, that work that you did, and that score that you got, and the questions you got wrong is pure gold in determining where your weaknesses are, where you can improve. You want to really dig into that. You probably should spend more time reviewing the test than you did taking it. I think that's probably a pretty good rule of thumb. You really, especially at the beginning, when you're first learning what your mistakes are, you really want to dig into that test and then identify, am I having problems with base reading skills, reading comprehension, paraphrasing would be another one I could add here, paraphrasing, summarizing, um, extracting particular evidence lines, uh, finding where the answer is in the passage, or am I having problems with this particular test, different question types, trap answers, and then you work on them from there. Uh, how do you improve them once identified? A lot more of its practice. Uh, reading, unfortunately, responds best to tutoring because it's helpful to have someone one on one kind of telling you what's up. Uh, courses can help. Reading books is hard in terms of like, oh, here's a prep book that I'm going to read to learn how to read. It's a little circular. Um, so reading is a little bit harder to improve, but certainly practice sections, review, um, working with friends or tutors, teachers, and then courses are really the, the, the recipe. Let's get to some chat questions here. What is the difference between AP chemistry and SAT chemistry? So let's note this. So we are looking at AP chem versus SAT chem. So I'm going to answer this in the context of someone preparing for SAT chem. Uh, AP chemistry is basically a miniature version of a first year general chemistry course that you would take in college. Uh, it is quite uh, broad in terms of the topics it covers. It goes in a certain uh, good amount of detail, good amount of depth. Uh, there's a lot of math compared to compared to like a, a regular chemistry course. Um, so it's rigorous. It's hard. Uh, typically, all this AP Physics, maybe BC Calc, are kind of the top three most challenging courses you can probably take in high school. Maybe Anatomy and Physiology would be another one. There are probably others, and I probably offended people by saying this, but this is my opinion that. Typically, these are some of the hardest courses. SAT chemistry, I would say, is like a level below AP, but a level above regular chemistry. So if we were to put a, you know, do a tier list here, the hardest would be AP chem, then you'd have SAT chemistry, and then maybe like an honors chemistry would be right below SAT, and then regular kind of standard chemistry would be below that. So if you're preparing for SAT chem, and you've done AP or you're doing AP, like if you're studying for AP tests right now, you're gonna be in a really good position to do well in the SAT chemistry, though you'll still wanna prepare for it because the test is particular about certain things. Uh, SAT chemistry, for example, is more broad, not, not super deep, and there's really not much math on it because you can't use a calculator. So you're limited in what you can do for math. Um, if you're in honors chemistry, you're probably need to study up a little bit to get to the level of SAT chemistry, probably not too much. If you're in regular chemistry, I would only take SAT chem if you really like and or are really good at, SA at chemistry and you're willing to study and prep because you're probably gonna need to study up a bit more to get to the level of SAT. Um, I would say like if you were to put the distance between these representing how close they are, these are much more bunched together than AP. Like AP is like way above this set. So SAT chemistry is probably closer to these than it is to, to AP. It's a good general rule. Someone sent me a 24 science score. So let me give you the top three, we'll say, things you can do to improve your science score at this level to go from, let's say, science being a 24 to science being, I don't know, high 20s. What are the top three things you can do? So this is going to be a broken record, but timed sections, so critical because you have to get used to the time management. That's probably one of the major issues holding down the score is being as efficient as you can. So do timed sections, make sure they're real sections from real tests. And then, of course, as we just said, review, 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 review. Uh, when it comes to your review and when you're learning, what you want to focus most of all at this point are your six question passages. These are what are called your data representation passages. The reason why you want to focus on these is there's probably a lot of gettable points in these passages 
excuse me, that you're missing for whatever reason. Uh, these passages, the six questions, uh, typically are easier than the others. So if you're missing points here, if you're having to skip or guess on them because of your time management, this is a huge area. You want to be as close to perfect, maybe a minus one in these six question passages as you can, because they are gimme points in many cases. Uh, what, would be the th what would be the third thing? I mean, there's a lot of things, but... Um... Mm -mm 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 -mm. Scientific... Me so learn scientific method. So you want to understand things like what are controls? What are variables? What are hypotheses? Things like that. Um, I have a video on this actually on my channel. Uh, it's part of the ACT science course, but it's available for free. Uh, just Google reason prep scientific method. You'll find it. Uh, you want to make sure you're, you're, you're solid on this. Uh, independent and dependent variable would be another example. So you should know what is a control? What is a variable? What is an independent variable? What is a dependent variable? What is a hypothesis? And how do these things interact? If you don't know that, if you're shaky on that, that's something you want to really study and uh, study up on. Uh, next question, how to take effective notes if you get a problem wrong? Also, do you, I guess you, that means recommend taking notes on the side when taking the reading exam. Okay, how to take notes. Uh, I would recommend whatever way you like to take notes would be the first place to start. So that would either be like a notebook, separate notebook, or you know, a Word document on your computer, or a laptop, or Evernote, or OneNote, or SimpleNote whatever note-taking apps you might use. I, you probably have your own preferences. Um, probably something handwritten would be the best because then you don't have to deal with like typing math into notebooks. So probably I would use a handwritten notebook, maybe some combination of that with some sort of computer document. Um, but one of the things you want to keep track of would be topic lists. Am I getting the same thing wrong again and again? Um, strategies, things that might work or, or don't work. So I would take notes. You can take notes in the test next to the problem as you review, but then I would transfer those notes into another central resource, like a written notebook, a Moleskine notebook, or a sketchbook, whatever, whatever you like to use. It doesn't really matter. As long as you're recording it and you're processing it um, some way, that's what matters. Follow-up question... Uh, when you're taking reading, uh, when you're doing a reading section, so SAT or ACT, doesn't matter, the question is, should you take notes as you're taking the test? And generally, no. Uh, I don't recommend it. Some other strategies recommend you annotate the passages, you read the paragraphs, and you summarize them. For reasons I won't go into, I think that's a waste of time. I don't think it actually helps that much. Uh, I think it just burns time. Uh, one reason being, let's say there's a paragraph that you read and annotate, and then there's no questions about that paragraph. What was the point? You just spent two minutes annotating something that they're not going to ask about. That's a waste, uh, among other reasons. So generally, no, I don't recommend that. I don't think it's necessary. In the end, if you do it and it works for you, that's fine. I'm just saying if you're not doing it now, there's no reason to start later. You're not missing out on anything. Would you say SAT chemistry is heavy content-based? Um, Not as much as AP. They have a lot more of what I call factoid questions on the SAT chemistry test. It's just like weird stuff that they like you to know. For example, acid rain is composed of sulfur oxides. Um, weird stuff like that that you should know. So they're like little facts. Uh, but it's more content than like a regular regular chemistry class, certainly less than an AP. Um some mathy type questions that are simple concepts. But yeah, it's more, I would say it's not really, what you, how do you phrase it? Content-based. Yeah, I think it's more conceptual than anything else. Certainly there's facts and things to know, but understanding concepts of, you know, how moles work and uh, gas laws and things like that is, is really a lot of what they're testing. What is the difference between ACT and SAT in English? Okay, so... What is the difference between ACT and SAT in English? Really nothing. Uh, ACT, I think, is harder when it comes to ACT English versus SAT writing. It's harder and um, there's just more questions and more time, whereas the a SAT English is much more limited. But they test a lot of the same things, a lot of the same rules. They both have rhetorical skills questions. Uh, so if you're studying for both tests, which typically I don't recommend, typically I recommend you pick one of the SAT or the ACT. But if you are studying for, for both, 
studying for one is the same as the other. They're really similar. So uh, for example, if you've used my SAT writing course and you wanted to check out my ACT English course for whatever reason, it wouldn't hurt you. I don't think it's the best use of your time, but there's a lot of overlap. SAT or ACT. Okay, so the question was, uh, targeted practice for difficult SAT math problems and grammar problems. So if you are looking for hard SAT math problems, Khan Academy is a good place to start. Um, real tests, of course, good place to start. Um, those are the top two sources. There are books out there, I won't name names, that purport to give you really hard problems as a way to prep for the SAT. I generally don't recommend them because they often make their problems hard in ways that they're not going to be hard on the real test. So for example, they'll make the math ugly, they'll make the numbers ugly, they'll make the question kind of conceptually confusing. Um, that's not, or they'll test something that's not even on the SAT. So I don't generally recommend books that purport to give you really hard questions. You want to stick as close to the, the source material as possible. So that would be Khan Academy and SAT. Uh, eventually, I'm planning uh, to... Uh, make some more worksheets for both SAT and ACT. That's a long time coming. They're really labor intensive, and I've got a lot of other things that I'm working on, including crash courses for the SAT and ACT. So that's quite on the back burner, but that would be at least a place to start, unfortunately. Probably not the answer you're looking for. You probably knew about Khan Academy, but because the SAT is still so new, this is the problem. It's still such a new test. It's only a few years old. We're super limited in our materials. How can I get a 36 on ACT science? Obviously a lot to say about it. Let me give you the, the number one thing besides time management. You gotta be able to answer every single question. Uh, it is know where the test is hard and where it isn't. So on those six question passages and on some of the questions in the seven question passages, the research summaries, the answers are gonna be straightforward and simple and you don't wanna overcomplicate it. On other questions, typically questions at the end of passages and questions that are wordier, questions based on experimental design and reasoning, those and outside knowledge to some extent, those are going to be the challenge questions. And those are going to be the ones you're really going to have to puzzle over and work on. And those are often the time consuming ones, the ones you'll leave until the end. Um, so know the test really well, know when you're overthinking it and when you need to think a little bit harder. And often a signal of that is, as I said, questions at the end of passage sets are typically harder, questions that have more words are typically harder, questions that are based on the passage as a whole are typically harder. So those are the ones where in your practice and when you're doing the test, you really wanna spend some extra attention. Advice for US history, SAT2. So I'm not really much of an expert in US history or the SATs you test for that. From what I've seen of it though, it's pure content. You just gotta know your stuff and there's no shortcut for that. Uh, reading books and reading your notes again and again is not gonna do it. The best thing you can do for any kind of learning, this applies to the SAT test, the ACT, the subject tests, uh, if you're learning facts and concepts is flashcards. You have to force yourself to produce the knowledge and then see if it matches the actual information. Simply reading, 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 reading is not going to do anything. You have to quiz yourself, flashcards, self-quizzing, whatever you might do to learn that. And then you'll get it down like that. And then that's that's really it for the, for the subject test in history, I would think. It's just, it's just concepts. It's just facts. So a follow-up actually about AP US history, which builds on what I just said about SAT history. The question is, I'm reviewing by reading outlines for every chapter, is that enough? So as I said, just reading is not gonna be good enough. I won't go into the details why, it's actually a really interesting kind of neuroscience, the cognitive science of learning, why that's the case, but just reading and rereading is useless. You won't learn anything, uh, or at least it'll be very inefficient. So as I said, what you wanna do is flashcards, self-quizzing, um, forcing yourself to produce the knowledge and then seeing if what you produced is correct. So it could be, you know, having, this thing keeps turning, this is annoying. I'll probably have to change this next time. Uh, having uh, flashcards with questions on it, like um, what were the, I'm making this up, but like what were the five major causes of the Revolutionary War or something? Uh, what was the Stamp Act? What was this, what was that? Um, and then forcing yourself to produce that knowledge, that is what's going to guarantee you that you're going to do well. Uh, that's what I did when I was doing APs when I went to college. That's what I learned eventually, especially, was uh, produce those flashcards, practice with those flashcards, force yourself to check yourself, test yourself. That is what's going to absolutely make you a, a rock star. 
Um, reading and rereading, not very useful. There's so much in AP World History. How would I study for that? Same thing. Um, flashcards, forced review, self-quizzing. That's the secret. That Honestly, that it, it's it's painful and it's hard work, but that's why it works. And that's really the secret for, for, for classes where you have to memorize a bunch of stuff. So history, um, some of the sciences like biology or anatomy and physiology, um, any of those things where you have to produce content, knowledge, even on like math when you want to learn formulas or sciences like chemistry or physics where you want to learn terms or formulas or concepts. That's the secret. That's really the secret. It's flashcards, self-quizzing, forcing yourself to produce that knowledge. That's what does it. Even in something like world history where there's a ton. In fact, it's probably more important there. How can I do better on purpose and main idea questions in the SAT reading? So again, it depends on the specific examples, right? the specific questions, the specific passages. Um, the main thing I would say, so let me go here. So the main piece of advice I would give you about main idea and purpose questions is make sure two things. Your answer is essential and comprehensive. So what do I mean by this? If you're trying to get the main idea of a passage or of a paragraph or the purpose of a paragraph or a passage, whatever it is, you want to make sure not to get hung up on a little detail. Like if there's a little detail in the passage that they make the answer, that's not the main idea or the primary purpose. That's just a detail. So you want to get the thing that's most of all, that's essentially the main idea, right? Or the primary purpose, not just something that's mentioned elsewhere. Similarly, it's got to be comprehensive. So like, let's say you see this a lot on the SAT and sometimes on the ACT. So let's say you've got a passage and it's like this and then this. Those are the lines of your passage. And then let's say you've got a question like what's the structure of the passage or the main idea? And let's say one of your choices is like this happens and then this happens and then this happens. Let's say what that's what it was. Typically what you're going to see is that each of these parts of the answer choice are going to sequentially map onto each chunk of the passage like that. So I've color coded it. This is what I mean by comprehensive. Typically your main idea choices are going to cover the most parts of the passage as they can. That's what it means to be main idea and it hits the main central point. So those are the general no, thoughts I can give about main idea questions. Is a 740 in SAT world history good? Sounds good. Generally, anything over 700 is good. 750 plus is generally, it depends on the test, but it's generally better. Um, so 740 is, is pretty solid. What I would do, let's see. So what I would do is, if you're curious about what Tests are good or bad. Let me switch over to desktop for a sec. Okay, so what you should do if you're curious whether your subject test is good or bad, you can also do this with the SAT or ACT because good or bad is a relative term, right? It's good if it's better than other students' scores, basically. Google SAT subject test percentiles and then click like the first link. And this is for 2015. Um, actually this, yeah, this is good. And this will give you a good idea. So this question was about, let's see, it was about, uh, it was about world history. So the question was, is a 740 good? Well, here's a 740 and that would be in the 84th percentile, which means it's better than 84% of the other students who took it, which is really good, especially for a self-selected test like this. Um, notice the drop-off. Once you get to about 700, uh, that's a 73rd percentile, which is still good, but you know, a 700 on the regular SAT would be very, very good. Uh, so obviously it's self-selected. Um, as you can see, 96th percentile is an 800, which means about 4% of students get an 800 on this. Gives you an idea of the competitiveness. What does your SAT writing course offer? Um, comprehensive, so it covers everything. So we go through all the grammar rules. We go through the rhetorical skills questions, the, print, the four principles to answer them. We go through examples. And I work through seven complete SAT tests question by question, passage by passage. Uh, it is everything you need for the SAT writing test and it is 100% free. So if you're not enrolled in it already, I recommend enrolling in it, starting on it. You work through that diligently, you do all the practice tests, you review the questions, you watch the videos, 
there's not much more you can do because like I said, I've made it to be as comprehensive as possible. Uh, SAT essay. In one of your videos, you recommended that completing all four pages will allow you to get enough marks. How can one improve a 666 to a 777? So the point I made in the SAT essay course, it also applies to the ACT essay, is the more you write, the higher the score. That's simply how it works. Now, you can't just write gibberish and fill the pages with garbage because it's still got to be good. But as a general rule of thumb, the more you write, the higher the score. So on the SAT, if you're getting to about two pages, it's generally speaking going to be hard for you to break out of a ceiling of a six, a six, a six, and a six, or a five, and a five, and a five. It's just going to be hard to do that. Once you can get to about two and a half to three pages, especially on the SAT, that's when you're in a really good position to be at least six, a six, and a six on the three scores. In terms of how to get to a seven, a seven, and a seven, you know, it depends on which part you're talking about. Um, most of the time, when it comes to the reading and the analysis scores for the SAT essay, most of the problems students have, it's just not enough detail. They have just haven't written enough. So provide more detail, be more specific, elaborate on your ideas. If you feel like you're gonna, if you, if you say something and then you're gonna move on, take a second and say, wait a minute, can I elaborate on this? Can I provide more detail? Can I be more specific? Can I give another example? Can I drive harder into my analysis, whatever it might be. That's the main thing I would say. If you're getting a six, a six, and a six on the reading, writing, reading analysis, and writing scores on the SAT essay, you're doing good things, so do more of them. That's really going to be the key. Do more of what you're doing. Push harder. Uh, you don't have to get to four pages. Um, you're given four pages, I believe, total to write on, but you don't have to fill up all four. Uh, up to three would be a good target, and the more you can push, the better. Um, but that will get you to at least a six, a six, and a six. And then from there, it's just more specificity, more details, elaborating, uh, being more uh, particular and specific with your analysis, which is usually where the scores lag. Most students have no problems or less problem getting to like a seven plus in the reading and maybe a seven plus in the writing. The analysis score usually lags. And I talk a lot about that in the SAT essay course. So again, my SAT essay course is also free, completely free. Part of it's on YouTube. Most of it's on my website, reasonprep.com. So you can take that full course and it's complete. So everything you need there is uh, everything you need. A uh, question about my SAT reading course. So let me show you that. So if you just go to my website, go around a little bit, you'll find my reading course. So let me just show that. So the reading course is not free. It is, there's some videos that are free. You can get a sample of what it looks like. Um, but uh, if you scroll down, if you go to the reading course thing, you scroll down and you see the class curriculum, you'll see exactly what's in the course. So we cover core videos. We cover the different question types, what the test is structured like, the core strategy for tackling the test, how to tackle dual passages, uh, some important facts and skills. We work through seven full SATs. So here's practice SAT one, here's two, here's three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, and then I also have other strategy videos, uh, core reading tactics, how to tackle uh, particular strategies and skills you need, uh, tactics for tackling certain question types like keyword questions, graph and figure, how to manage your time. So this is again, a comprehensive course. This in my opinion is everything you would need to do really well on the reading test. Now the reading is always the hardest to improve. So, um, you know, it's gonna require a lot of practice and effort, but certainly a lot of the, the lessons that I teach in that course are gonna be uh, really helpful for that kind of thing. Uh, which score can you increase the quickest? Typically English for the ACT and writing for the SAT is typically the ones that improve the most quickly. Uh, for the next quickest improvement for the SAT would be math. There's quite a gap between the writing and the math in that regard, though. And then for the ACT, probably the math. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll say that. It's it's pretty close, though. And then the reading for the SAT is definitely the hardest to improve on um, for a lot of reasons, some of which I've mentioned. It's more of a skill than content knowledge. For ACT, it's probably a tie then between reading and science, because again, for the same reason. Um, so if you're looking for quick gains, maximize your score in ACT English and SAT writing. Very doable. Almost everybody, if they put in the time and effort um, practicing using my courses, for which are free for SAT writing and ACT English, put in the time, you should be able to get a 30 plus on ACT and a 650, maybe 700 plus, 35 plus uh, on SAT writing. 
I think that's a pretty reasonable expectation if you put in the time and effort. So I'm going to have another live stream on Sunday, 2 o'clock Eastern Time. So it's going to be Sunday, 2 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, on YouTube, same place, same time. Uh, if you're uh, already on my mailing list, you'll get an email about it. If you're in my Facebook group, you'll get a message about it or you'll there'll be a post about it. Uh, if you follow my YouTube channel, you'll see the thing pop up in your sub box. So plenty of ways to know about when it's going to happen. So if you can make that, again, send me your questions ahead of time uh, or you can ask them in chat. Uh, I'm planning on hopefully having two sessions per week. That's the goal for now. Um, still learning and experimenting, seeing what works, seeing what people like. So any feedback or requests or anything will help me. Uh, but probably about two per week. I'm going to vary the days and vary the times to try to get people to go. Um, and um, what was I going to say? Uh-oh, lost my train of thought. Okay, so next stream will be then. The recording for this will be up on YouTube on um, probably tomorrow condensed. And uh, there's one other question I'll ask about enrolling. So people who enroll in my courses, SAT or ACT, you can ask me questions in the courses. So there's in, under each video, you can leave a comment. I respond to every single comment personally. It's just me. I don't have other people working for me. Everything I do is me. Uh, so if you enroll in my courses, or I also do online tutoring as well, uh, you get to interact directly with me. I do that also in the free courses as well. But in the other courses, I, of course, interact with you one-on-one -on -one too on those topics. Uh, I also answer emails from students who are in the, the paid courses as well. Uh, so there's plenty of interaction with me in those courses. Um, yeah, so next live stream is Sunday, 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Send your questions. I hope to see you then. Like I said, I'm going to have two per week, and uh, we'll see where it goes. And probably maybe in the summer, I might have more. Again, we have to see where things go. Maybe I'll do three per week or four per week. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I might also, maybe if you're interested in this, float the idea, I might have more of a private groups um, for students who enroll my courses, for example. We'll see. Um, so any requests, questions, let me know. Uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight, and I will, or today, depending on when the time is, and I will see you all in the next stream. Bye-bye.